Now we'll make things a little more complicated by adding a harmonic driving force to our damped oscillator. So as before, we'll start the restoring force, negative kx, due to a spring in Hooke's law, a damping force, a viscous damping force. Here I've drawn a piston pushing through some, some fluid to give negative r times the velocity. And now we add our driving force, f naught e to the i omega t. So f naught is the amplitude, and the real part of e to the i omega t will give us a cosine function. To get the differential equation, we use Newton's law again, force equals mass times acceleration, and add up the forces, the restoring force, the damping force, and the driving force. Leaving just the driving force here on the right-hand side, we find that the sum of, of these terms here is now equal to the driving force, whereas previously it was equal to zero. So now we have an inhomogeneous differential equation instead of a homogeneous differential equation as we had before. Just to remind you, the natural frequencies of the undriven system from the previous videos were gamma, the damping rate, r on m, omega naught, omega naught squared rather, is k on m, and omega dash squared was given by omega naught squared minus gamma squared on 4. And these, uh, these frequencies will come uh, in our derivation as we work through it. So what happens? Before we solve this system analytically, I want to draw a picture of what happens so that we know where we're going. So using Mathematica I just did a simulation. This is time on the horizontal axis. The yellow line will be force, the blue line position. And this is what we see. What we see is the yellow line is a sinusoidal driving force. It's the same as we go through the simulation. At short times, what we see is the position of the oscillator looks kind of crazy. It seems to have two different frequencies going on here and Sort of double humps and kind of all kinds of stuff. It doesn't look sinusoidal at all. But as the simulation time increases, at long times over here, the position seems to be at the same frequency as the force, albeit 180 degrees out of phase. So we can identify two different regimes. This short time period here we call the transient regime, and at long time periods, this is called the steady state regime. What's happening here is at short times, we see behavior due to the natural response of the oscillator. So that is, we see this long frequency here, that's the frequency due to the natural dynamics of the oscillator, and this higher frequency term here, that's due to the driving. So what we see here is a mixture of the natural response, that is the solution of the homogeneous equation. That dies out, and you can see it dies out sort of exponentially, because it's an underdamped oscillator. And then at long times, we did get the driven steady state response. So what we're going to do to find the steady state response is try a solution of the form a e to the i phi e to the i omega t. So that is at the same frequency as the drive with some phase shift relative to the drive and some amplitude. I feel it's worth mentioning here we have three frequencies in play. We have the frequency of the undamped oscillator with mass n and spring constant k. We've got the frequency of the damped oscillator which is very similar to the undamped oscillator but modified by the damping. And if the damping is small, then these two frequencies are close to each other. And we also have the arbitrary driving frequency, omega. Let's return now to our differential equation and see if we can solve it. The solution we're trying, remember, was x of p, a e to the i phi e to the i omega t. We'll take this function for x and its first and second derivatives and in the same sort of way as we did for the homogeneous equation, we'll substitute them into this equation and then see if we can find parameters that allow this to be a solution. In this case, we're looking for values of a and phi. So we substitute them in and we get this expression here. We can remove a factor of a e to the i phi, like this, and then divide through by this term in brackets, giving a e to the i phi equal to this function here. So this is a complex number. And this is also a complex number. We can write uh, x of p, therefore, as a e to the i phi times e to the i omega t. So what we see here is this function for x of p oscillates at the driving frequency, omega, and has no free parameters. As an exercise, I'll let you show that phi can be expressed in terms of the parameters of the oscillator like this, and a, the amplitude of the response, can be expressed like this. One important thing we've got to realize here is that because the solution has no free parameters, 
it's not quite the total solution. The amplitude and phase here are fixed, but we know the complete solution of the differential equation must allow the fitting of initial conditions. So there has to be something more. But there is something more, because remember, we solve this homogeneous equation. That is all this left hand side equals zero. So whatever function x solves the homogeneous equation will evaluate to zero, which means we're free to add it to the solution we found on the last page to the inhomogeneous equation. The beauty is that the solution to the homogeneous equation includes two free parameters that we can fit to the initial position and initial velocity. Because remember, we had this solution to the homogeneous equation. For the underdamped case, there was a decaying exponential with time constant tau multiplied by these oscillating exponentials. The two free parameters for fitting the initial position and velocity are embedded in C1 and C1 star, these complex coefficients out the front here. I could equally write this as some number C, which is now a real number, with the decaying exponential and the real part of this uh, oscillatory exponential and a phase shift delta. So the two free parameters now are the real number C and the phase shift delta. Normally we don't bother writing the function for the real part here, we just take that as being assumed. So in total then, the solution becomes the sum of the solution to the homogeneous equation and the solution we found to the inhomogeneous equation. So we have this part here that describes the response of the system in the steady state after it's been evolving for a long period of time. And this is the transient response that decays to zero with some time constant tau. A mathematician would call this the particular integral, that's the steady state response, and the complementary function is the transient response that decays to zero. Another way of visualizing a damped driven oscillator is to look at something we call phase space. The top plot here is what we're sort of used to, where we have the position on the vertical axis and time on the horizontal axis. The bottom plot has the velocity on the vertical axis and the position on the horizontal axis. If we let these two graphs animate together, we see damped oscillations on the top graph as a function of time, as we expect. On the bottom graph, we see a spiral, and the reason for this is that the position and velocity are 90 degrees out of phase. And if you plot two things that are 90 degrees out of phase parametrically, like sine and cos, you get a circle. But the circles are getting smaller because of the damping, so we get a spiral. If we now look at the damped driven case on the right-hand side, then we see some quite complicated behavior, both for position as a function of time and in phase space. What we're seeing here is the transient behavior dying out. The transient behavior is this long period here. And eventually, for longer times, then all we're left with is the driven frequency, which is this high frequency behavior we see here. And what you see is this red dot going around in an ellipse in phase space. And we call this ellipse a limit cycle.